Welcome everyone to our session today on clinical and economic perspective of continuous diffusion of oxygen in Canada. I'd just like to take a moment to introduce our panel. Dr. Brian Chan is an affiliate scientist in neuroengineering and therapeutics at Kite, which is part of the Toronto Rehab Institute, as well as an assistant professor for health policy management and evaluation at the University of Toronto. Kathy Much is a registered nurse and certified WOCC in Canada and is well known to most of you in NSWAP. Rosemary Hill is a registered nurse uh, with Lionsgate Hospital in Vancouver. She's certified as a WOCN and as a WOCC in Canada. She's a member of the BC Skin and Wound Committee and has been very involved with and SWOCC over the years. And lastly, my name is Karen Campbell. I'm a registered nurse and certified WOCC in Canada as well. And so we're gonna be reviewing the evolution of oxygen and wound healing. There's gonna be a short literature review with case studies to support. And then Dr. Chan is going to be reviewing our health economics research. So just to review with you the evolution of oxygen compared to the cell phone, as you can see in the 1950s when hyperbaric oxygen was introduced, uh, people had to go into chambers. It was quite a extensive procedure, but as time has gone on, we now are able to deliver oxygen in a very wearable format using a unit that is about the size of a cell phone. And so this is the product um, that I'm gonna be talking about. And you can see with continuous diffusion of oxygen, you have a small uh, generator and then dressings that actually deliver oxygen to the wound bed. And then at the top, you can see a carrying case so that your patients can be uh, mobile and carry this unit around with them. So let's start looking at the evidence. I wanna talk initially about uh, a randomized controlled uh, study that was done in the US. And uh, as you can see, um, this was done with diabetic foot ulcer patients. And we had an active CDO arm and we had a placebo arm. And so in the placebo arm, no one knew if they were getting oxygen or not. This was double blinded. But everyone had um, offloading, everyone had uh, debridement, everyone had a the same dressing and the oxygen levels were preset to three mils per hour. So the primary outcome of this study was full wound closure defined as complete re-epithelialization with no drainage. But secondary outcomes were time to wound closure, effective baseline wound size on wound closure, and the effect of wound chronicity on uh, wound closure. The study was done in 34 centers across the continental United States. There were no significant differences in demographics between the active and the sham arm. And just of, of interest, all but one patient performed their own dressing changes outside of the clinic. So patients were able to be fairly independent. And so if you look now at our results, the time to ulcer closure was significantly shorter with CDO for all uh, treated subjects. And you can see that that was statistically significant. As well, the time to 50% ulcer closure was significantly shorter with the CDO arm. And again, that was statistically significant. And of interest, as the wound size increased, the relative performance of CDO as well uh, improved. And so there seemed to be more benefit for larger wounds. And you can see the results on the, on the graph. But as well, as wounds increased in chronicity and were less responsive to moist wound therapy, the relative performance of CDO increased from 200% to 300%. And that was statistically significant as well. And so it seems like the more one needs uh, continuous diffusion of oxygen, the better it, it closes. And I find um, this personally very exciting. So in summary, we had a very rigorous, fully blinded study designed with a placebo arm. There was a run-in uh, period. And if wounds in this run-in period were closing, very well, they were actually eliminated from the study. And so only 
patients who, whose wounds were not responding as they should were included in the study. We had highly accurate digital photos and we used planimetry. Everyone was blinded. And in the US, the Center for Medicaid uh, and Medicare and Medicaid st uh, cited this study design as the gold standard for studies going forward. And so in summary, CDO closed significantly better and faster 200% better and faster. It performed perform better in larger wounds, more chronic wounds, weight-bearing wounds, populations predisposed to diabetes, and in frequently debrided wounds. And it also appeared to reduce severe infections. So now I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about a pain study that has taken place. Now, this is a pilot study. And this took place in Chicago, 20 patients with 23 wounds. Most of them are female. You can see the average age was 74. The baseline wound size was much bigger than the diabetic foot ulcer. And in fact, one of the wounds was 117 centimeters squared. The average age of the wounds uh, was 162 days. So you can see that most of these were, were chronic wounds. And uh, you can see, um, the race, but as well, the median baseline pain uh, for these patients out of uh, 10 was, was an eight. And so the types of wounds involved in this study were most commonly mixed venous and vascular, followed by straight venous, followed by straight vascular. And um, most of these wounds, 87% were above the malleolus. And so all patients reported significant pain relief. 100% went to zero or one um, with, with open wounds and pain relief was fairly rapid. So by four days, 39% were pain-free, 52% had a greater than 75% reduction in pain and 91% experienced noticeable pain relief. And several of the participants reported complete pain relief the day of the CDO application. So now another exciting study that I'd like to share with you is looking at wound fluid um, and the impact of CDO and wound fluid. And so uh, this was a study uh, done in the US. Uh, again, it, this is a pilot study, but at one week there was significant increases in cytokines um, and these are changes relative to baseline immediately before um, CDO. So in the study, we actually looked at wound fluid before starting CDO and then at week one of treatment, week two and week three of th treatment. And you can see, for example, TGF beta increased by 820%, VEGF uh, increased by 430%, platelet derived growth factor increased by 280%. And uh, in three weeks, 53% of the, of the subjects had at least 50% of the wound of their wound reduced. As well, IGF-1 um, increased by 660%, tumor necrosis fact factor alpha increased by 450%, and interleukin-6 increased by 420%. And at one week, there were significant changes in TCOM from baseline, both medially and, and laterally in these participants' feet. And so you can see from this uh, chart, I think it shows very well on the far left, you can see before starting CDO, then in the first uh, week of CDO treatment, cytokines go up. And in the second week, more growth factors go up. But by the third week, then we have a normalized wound fluid where previously it had been more uh, chronic and now it, it, it's behaving more like an acute wound. Another interesting study was, it, that's been done in the US is, lo is looking at recidivism and scarring. And this was done at the Baylor College of Medicine. And what they were finding is when they had uh, toe amputation, about 30% of their wounds were um, breaking down. And so they wanted to see if applying CDO to the actual amputation site that's closed um, would, would prevent some of this. And so what they found is that in, uh, the, in, in terms of tissue necrosis, uh, participants that were treated with CDO had no tissue uh, necrosis versus 
43% in the uh, control group as well, successful closure of, of that surgical site was much higher in the CDO, 75% versus 29%. And as well, the wound length reduction, so the reduction of the scar was 70% greater in uh, CDO versus the control group. And what the researchers uh, found it was that there was a no noticeable trend in favor of CDO to accelerate healing in surgically closed wounds and to reduce the likelihood of adverse events. In another uh, study that was done, look again, looking again at recidivism and scarring, and this was looking at anterior neck uh, surgery. And so these would be patients who would have had um, the thyroid or parathyroid surgery. And because it's at the front of their neck, the, the state of the scar is very important for cosmetic reasons. And so what they found when they applied a CDO to the surgical site after um, in the OR was that there was an incision length reduction of 40% in the CDO group versus the control group. And there was greater than 10% scar reduction at four weeks. Uh, and so using CDO may improve wound healing after anterior neck surgery. And there, the researchers felt that there was a better outcome for scar visualization. So just briefly, what are the indications for use for CDO? It's used for healable chronic stalled wounds and the wounds can be from diabetes, venous stasis, it can be mixed disease, post-surgical infections, arterial ulcers, pressure injuries, infected residual wounds, skin grafts, burns and uh, frostbite. And the contraindications for this are the same contraindications that you have with uh, HBO. So wounds with inadequate perfusion to, to support healing, ulcers due to acute thrombophlebitis, ulcers due to uh, Raynaud's disease, necrotic wounds covered with eschar and slough. And as you can well imagine, this then blocks the diffusion of oxygen into the wound bed. And then wounds with a fistula or a deep uh, sinus tract with unknown uh, depth. Now I'm going to briefly review a case uh, of patient independence that was developed by a colleague of ours, Edia Trell. I have had two wounds, one of which was healed. We used iodosorb pretty well as the main state and it took its time, but it worked. I got a second wound in the middle of March, roughly, uh, used the same sort of protocol, but it didn't seem to be moving forward as it was. So clinician suggested we try the O2, and I said, sure, I'm game for that. So I had a piece of equipment uh, sent to me along with the dressings, uh, followed the instructions, uh, took two days to get comfortable with the process. Um, I was able to wear athletic shorts during the time with EO2. Uh, I wore the equipment underneath the shorts. It worked very well. Uh, the tubing was not an issue after a couple of days and using compression socks to make sure the tubing didn't get uh, snagged anywhere. Changing the dressings was no problem. It was actually quite simple uh, once you had the confidence that it wasn't going to uh, really blow up on you. It took um, just a matter of uh, short minutes <clears throat> to unscrew tubes, put, take off dressing, put the dressing on, and then re hook it up. The, uh, <clears throat> during the time period, uh, the wound got smaller and smaller, which was nice. And but during that time, I did have uh, electronic access by a text or pictures to the clinician, and was able to just discuss it as it was proceeding. So although I was doing all of this at home, it was as if someone was was with me. Uh, <clears throat> 
the wound, as I said, got smaller and smaller. And uh, hopefully in the next week or so, it will have gone away. I had uh, good results and uh, I'm very happy with the use of it. And when I look back on it, it really was very uh, a simple process. So uh, I am quite happy with the results. Great. And um, as you can see there, uh, Bill's wound went on to complete closure. So just a little bit of a background. He's a 73-year-old male diagnosed as pre-diabetic with marginal venous insufficiency. So he had a, a small red area in his lower leg that broke open and he was leaving the wound open to the air. Um, he did admit to picking at the area, uh, but found that this made the wound worse. He was using uh, band-aids and then moved to gone but at this point, he, he had not involved any uh, medical experts to actually see the wound. At the end of uh, a couple of months, though, home care became involved. So this is a picture from April 30th, um, and we were able to do his assessment um, via both a photos, video, uh, telephone. He reported that the area was painful, there was slough present, there was poor looking granulation tissue, and the, the peri wound was pink red, but not warm to touch. And you can see the measurements that were taken. So initially uh, he was using polycadexamer uh, iodine and an absorptive dressing for about 14 days. And um, the clinician who was involved with him remotely had requested a vascular status assessment. Uh, he had slightly lower limb edema that uh, was pretty good in the morning, but the edema worsened throughout the day. Um, he had pedal pulses and he was uh, wearing uh, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury compression stockings in the past, but currently wasn't wearing them. And the clinician uh, had instructed him then to put the stockings on in the morning and to take them off at bedtime. And his skin was very dry and he um, indicated that his leg was often itchy. So he may have some sort of a, a dermatitis. A medical grade cream was recommended um, just to deal with the dry skin. So supportive um, education occurred to give him the confidence and, and success to complete the dressing changes. And as you could, you, you heard from him, he was able to do that fairly easily after a couple of days. He was also taught what to look for, you know, looking for signs of infection, changes in wound bed color and change in the exudate level. And he was also taught how to reduce and uh, minimize cross-contamination and prevent any potential uh, wound infections. And so he he was able to send photos of the dressings to his clinicians and you can see one there at the bottom. And so after two months of moist wound healing, his wound uh, had not responded at home. Um, then CDO was started on, on May 15th. On June 14th, they did add antimicrobial primary dressings for two, uh, two weeks. Under, uh, under the CDO dressing and he was very engaged in his care. You can see actually he was sending photos of what the wound looked like and I don't know if you can see this on the slide, um, but he measured it and then made notes and uh, sent that to the clinician. So he had a wound for six months. So he had two months of his own management, which was keep it open to the air. Two months of moist wound healing. Um, the wound was still stalled with little change. And then two months of CDO uh, therapy. And actually after three months, this wound went on to complete closure. Uh, as, as you can completely understand that CDO as an adjunctive therapy works well when it's used in combination with uh, best practice. So this individual needed compression, which he uh, was using. He was able to complete his dressing changes independently at home uh, and the visits were done remotely. Um, he had education remotely and it, it's, this is an example of how CDO is so easy to use. Uh, and patients can be self, can self manage and can be independent. Now I'm going to turn this over to Kathy Much.
Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to share with you a case that we had on Prince Edward Island. Uh, this is a gentleman, 69 year old male, who developed a painful lesion on his left lower leg about two months, greater than two months ago when we first saw him. It started as a black dot. His history was a venous disease, uh, no history of DVTs, bilateral superficial varicosities, dermatitis, edema. Um, and he did uh, say that he wore his compression hose consistently. He had liver cirrhosis as a side. His ABPI was 1.27 bilaterally. Next. So just to review, in January, uh, it was a small wound was noticed March 11th. During that initial visit, when uh, my colleague saw him, the wound was debrided, silver gel was applied and compression hose and antibiotics were started. Uh, he returned uh, a week later with a lot of pain. Wound was large, more clearly defined, with a mix of slough and viable tissue and eschar. Uh, gentian violet dressings and two layer compression wraps were started. Again, in another week, he was seen. Wound was larger, uh, sloughy with some adherent and loose eschar. Again, debrided and uh, gentian violet and two layer compression wraps were continued. Next. I saw him first um, in April 9th, so uh, sometime after the wound had initially started. You can see that it had become quite well demarcated, but was not progressing as well as one would hope. There was definitely ashgar still present with slough, but there was some granulation buds. But what was really uh, serious or concerning about it was his degree of pain. It had gone from being quite uncomfortable to him not being able to sleep, eat, and was barely able to walk the hall length to get into the clinic room. Con continuous diffusion of oxygen was initiated and continued with the compression reps as well. Thank you. April 16th, a week later, the wound you can see is cleaned up considerably. Now, when Karen was explaining about the importance of debridement and removing the ashkar, his wound was so painful that there was no way we could touch it to remove the ashkar even with freezing. Um, so the oxygen was applied directly. And what was the good news was that it hydrated the wound enough and the ashkar basically lifted off without any pain involved. You can see that the edges too are starting to uh, epithelialize. There's a good edge, nice and pink coloring, and the peri wound area has also improved in color. Next. By June 4th, his pain was 0 out of 10, which is really dramatic. Uh, it, his, his pain was really terribly intense. Um, and his wound is, is healing very well. Nice granulation, and it's much smaller. Next. So uh, he was seen a month later, and you can see that the wound now is, is uh, getting quite dry. The, it's healed well. Um, his compression, his edema is well managed. There's no peri wound erythema, and the CDO was discontinued at that time. Next. July 11th, um, you can see that a month later, it has completely epithelialized and with nice healthy skin and peri wound skin is also looking very good. Next. I also wanted to say that part of the reason that we took the, um, the CDO off July 3rd was because he arrived saying that his opposite leg had developed a black sore that was also extremely painful to him, just like the pain on his left leg. Pain was list, he described it as 10 out of 10. The wound bed was 100% slough, not particularly big. Um, and uh, if I hadn't been involved with this patient on the other leg, I perhaps would not have cho chosen C CDO. But because I did, I thought I want to stop this pain right away and get it healing. So immediately put it on. He arrived back in the next week, zero pain, and the wound was fully granulated. We uh, stopped, discontinued the CDO, and he continued to close completely epithelialize. Next. So just a quick review. From January, uh, when he first noticed the wound, until April, things deteriorated. Even with good practice of compression and topical wound management, uh, the wound was getting larger and his pain had definitely increased. So from April to July, the wound 
quickly cleaned up and, and uh, contracted with good granulation and good scar tissue. And July 11th, it had remained closed and he progressed to not, not having any reoccurrences. Thank you. All right, so uh, you just heard great presentations from both Karen and Kathy, and I will be following that up with the economic perspective on CDO. So can we go to the next slide? So Karen did a great summary on the clinical evidence for CDO and some of the uh, many uh, benefits in terms of clinical outcomes, such as the number of uh, individuals with ulcers healed. But however, to realize those outcomes, uh, can, can we go to the next slide, please? A decision maker or a funder will have to decide on investing, whether to invest in the technology itself. So the technology and its related supplies. And so from an economic lens, we want to look at whether the improvements in these outcomes as a result of CDO is worth the investment in this technology. Go to the next slide. So we conducted a study looking at the cost effectiveness of CDO in comparison to negative pressure wound therapy. And we did this from the perspective of the public health care payer in Ontario. So this study will, uh, will present whether it may be a good idea for the CDO to be publicly funded in Ontario. Next slide. We did this by taking a, an individual, simulating it over a, a span of five years, starting off by taking some of the uh, clinical data that has been presented by, by Karen in the short term, so the uh, number of ulcers healed, and then extrapolating those results over a five-year period, next slide, and accumulating the costs that would be accrued over this five-year time frame, as well as the quality-adjusted life years. Next slide. We would then take that same individual and simulate that individual if they were to receive negative pressure wound therapy instead. So taking a look at the short-term clinical outcomes, instead this time with negative pressure wound therapy, next slide, and then accumulating the cost and the quality adjusted life years uh, for this individual if they were to receive negative pressure wound therapy instead. Next slide. And then we repeated this over and over for a population of about 10,000 individuals. So this creates a, uh, a, a study cohort to analyze. And we compared the cost for individuals receiving uh, CDO versus the cost they would accumulate if they had negative pressure wound therapy instead, as well as the difference in quality adjusted life years. Okay, next slide. Now, a bit more detail in terms of how we extrapolated costs and outcomes, we used what is known as uh, Markov mo models. And in this case, uh, based on the results from the short-term clinical outcomes, an individual will fall into one of these health states. And over time, as the individual progresses over time, they will transition between uh, different health states depending on the risk of uh, major minor amputations, infections, whether they will heal over time or maybe an uh, ulcer will re recur. And each one of these health states have a cost associated with it, as well as a quality adjusted life year associated with it. And as an individual progresses from health state to health state, they accumulate those costs. Okay, next slide. Now, some results that we found from our analysis, first of all, if we just take a look at the cost of the treatment itself, so how much does it cost to receive CDO versus negative pressure wound therapy, we found that it, on average in a week, the treatment cost of uh, CDO was uh, almost half of that of negative pressure wound therapy. And if we take a look at the five-year costs, we find that overall an individual receiving CDO would cost uh, almost $5,000 less than that of negative pressure wound therapy and have slightly better quality adjusted life years. Next slide. Now, when we repeat this, uh, this uh, analysis over and over to account for the uncertainty in the data, we found that uh, 
uh, after taking a look at the, all the repeats, about 79% of them presented the similar results, lower cost for CDO, as well as higher quality adjusted life years. And this represents uh, quite a large percentage uh, showing the same type of results. Next slide. What we also did was we also did some sensitivity analysis. So taking a look at what the outcomes would look like if we were to change the comparator, if we were to take a look at more chronic ulcers, um, if there was a requirement for debridement at all follow-up visits, um, many assumptions uh, that were changed to take a look at how it affected the results. And if you uh, were listening in on Karen's presentation of the clinical outcomes and how the uh, num the percentage of uh, wounds healed actually seemed to improve the more chronic the ulcers became. It, it, it comes to no surprise that the results continue to show uh, a reduction in cost with CDO as well as a positive quality adjusted life years, uh, even if we were to change the, the assumptions, change the comparators in our model. Next slide. So, however, despite the robustness of the results, our analysis still had some limitations. Uh, first of all, the results were uh, very Ontario specific because the model inputs were, uh, many of them came from Ontario sources. And so it, the results of our analysis are specific to the Ontario healthcare system. Um, they also, there was no direct comparison in terms of the clinical data between CDO and some of the other advanced uh, diabetic foot ulcer treatments, such as negative pressure wound therapy. So we had to look at the results indirectly. However, if there was a future study looking at uh, comparing these, uh, these types of interventions directly, we can get a more accurate result. As well, there wasn't much in terms of long-term outcomes when we take a look at CDO as well as uh, just taking a look at ulcers in general. Uh, there was very little long-term outcomes. Okay, next slide. However, we can conclude based on the results and with some of the limitations in mind that the results seem to indicate that CDO has lower costs when we compare it to negative pressure wound therapy, as well as slightly improved quality adjusted life years and even when we change the assumptions, when we uh, take a look at the uncertainty, the results appear to remain relatively robust, meaning we don't see a flip to the, those types of results, higher cost or um, worse outcomes. And all these results are, have been published in uh, International Wound Journal and can be accessed online. And that's it. Well, thank you, team, for um, all of that information. Uh, and now um, I'd like to just take you through a case study, one of my more recent case studies of a woman who had um, breast reconstruction surgery. Uh, it was a high risk situation because about 20 years earlier, she had had breast cancer to that breast and it had radiation. And so here we were 20 years later with a reoccurrence doing some surgery and a breast reconstruction and she developed tissue uh, necrosis, or sometimes we call it a reperfusion injury. She was 66 years old, and um, as I say, uh, definitely it had that radiation and chemo to the right breast. So I'm gonna walk you through a few photos of um, how she presented um, post-operatively. So November 16th, we were looking at this patch area right over the nipple. And there was the thought that she would more than likely lose the nipple as well. Anyway, as we looked at it and she did her own research, um, she began to say, well, what about hyperbaric? But in the midst of COVID and travel and restrictions, I said, you know, um, we, we don't have many hyperbaric places here in BC and it, it's difficult and sometimes it's getting on a ferry boat. So I said, look, I have this portable um, device that's going to deliver continuous delivery of oxygen. How about we try that? And the surgeon was on board and um, the patient continued to come to our treatment room and I would change her dressing. Based on the size of the wound, I started it at three uh, milliliters per hour so that there was that continuous flow. And I'll, I'll mention that I find it helpful to use a methylene blue gentian violet dressing as well as a non-bordered foam dressing. 
And I'll show you, um, that's the, the, the picture of the dressing. And you know, it's interesting, I often, to prevent any slippage, I'll use a little bit of strip paste around the wound and it really anchors the dressing and helps the, the flow of oxygen. Always be prepared though, there is a fair amount more drainage to the wound when you are using oxygen therapy. Um, so as you can see by December 14, a few weeks later, we were actually able to salvage the nipple and you just see there's a, a much healthier uh, granulation tissue um, and a much better perfused area. Um, and, and there we proceeded on to uh, December 23rd. And that was particularly, this for her was like a, a little Christmas present because as we approached Christmas, she realized she would not require further surgery because that initially was the presentation that she might need more surgery and she just couldn't fathom that. She was thrilled she wasn't gonna have to do any hyperbaric oxygen or travel anywhere. And then um, this particular plastic surgeon opted to, when we got a little bit closer and finishing said, you know what, Rosemary, why don't we just approximate the edges, close that area and there she proceeded to be closed, remains closed many months later. In fact, I just got a card from her. She's doing very, very well. I think a, a piece that's really important to this story is that this woman also struggled with depression. And when she saw this wound after her surgery, she was very, very upset. And so um, I was so pleased that I had this modality to offer as an option to assist with healing uh, to the point of closure and remaining closed. Um, uh, as you can imagine, uh, struggling with the reoccurrence of breast cancer is not an easy time at all. So um, anyway, that was my story. And, and so although I've had the opportunity to use oxygen therapy on diabetic foot ulcers, this was an interesting case where we could explore um, a reperfusion injury and see how we could bring some oxygen uh, to that, that uh, wound uh, environment. So I'm gonna conclude with that, but I also wanna let you know that this is an opportunity for questions um, and then the, the team will try and give you some answers to those questions. Because as I say, it is a relatively new um, modality in the marketplace. And um, so feel free to bring forth your questions and the team and myself will try and uh, uh, respond and uh, give you some guidance. Thank you.